Hello, everyone. This is Mary Keurig with Front Runners Innovate. And as you know, we do love to connect and pack partners, and we like to bring to you world's problem solvers. <laughs> and we have one with us today, David Wheeler. And David is the principal. Should I say a principal or the principal? A principal. A principal. Okay. At Sustainable Transitions. And we've just been chatting a little bit. Uh, and I loved being able to read his profile because he has such an academic background and the way that he has brought his subject matter, which I'm going to let him talk about a little bit, up through that that whole, um, let's just say marketplace or audience or, you know, entity uh, industry space, if you will, that uh, how he's done that in a way that's really created um, sort of a world-class way of hitting that education sector with something that's going to change everybody's lives, you know, down the road. So um, I want to bring him to everybody because of that, but also because I think that it gives us some ideas about how we approach problem solving the way that they're doing it. So David, I'm going to be quiet and let you take the floor and tell us a little bit about yourself first, and then we'll get to what you're doing under the organization that you're serving. So tell us a little bit about you. Well, thank you, Mary, and, and it is uh, delightful to be part of this conversation, and, and uh, I'm very honored to have been invited to contribute to your series of, of discussions. Uh, my background is quite eclectic. Uh, I'm a scientist originally, so I have a, a, a degree in, and a PhD in microbiology. Oh, wow. um, but I, I, I strayed away from bench science many years ago, but haven't lost my belief in scientific rigor and looking at the evidence, which mm. brings us full circle to some of the challenges the world is facing today with respect to climate change, biodiversity loss, and so on. So I, I still have that scientific yeah. perspective. Uh, but my career has, has bridged international development uh, in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa, mm -hmm. focused on water quality and public health issues, um, a, a corporate life, working with a company called The Body Shop International, which is a cosmetics firm, mm. uh, where I spent most of the 1990s, precisely because that was a, a firm with a very serious commitment to sustainability mm. issues. Um, we made very early investments in renewable energy. In 1992, in fact, we commissioned a wind farm as mm. part of, a, of an offset. Yeah. So uh, I've always been interested in trying to walk the walk as well as talk the talk, in that case, in a corporate environment. Um, but since the turn of the century, I, I returned to academia and I, I've done a number of jobs, uh, an endowed professor of sustainability in Canada, mm -hmm. a dean of management or business on both sides of the Atlantic. I've been a president of a small university, which we also took to carbon neutrality through a wind farm investment. Mm -hmm. um, but since uh, exiting uh, the world of academia from an administrative perspective. Mm. I've been very much focused on innovation in, in academia and elsewhere mm -hmm. um, with a view to bringing sustainability knowledge and the ability to act on that knowledge to as broad a, an audience as possible. So many of our current projects are kind of aimed at you know, how do we get the knowledge that's required for young people today and in the future into their hands because basically colleges and universities are, we believe, not yet equipping young people with all of the panoply of skills, soft skills and hard skills mm -hmm. that they will need to navigate the next 20, 30 years of their careers, simply because the world will be so tumultuous and so challenging. Uh, and that will require new forms of being new skills to navigate effectively. So that, that's the challenge and the opportunity and that, that's really what most of our projects these days are aimed at. Okay, and the, the organization itself, is that a nonprofit? Yes, I mean, we, we operate in Costa Rica, yeah. which is at home most of the year. So everything that we do gets plowed back into local causes. We, okay. we have a, a, a farm here that we're uh, attempting to run a very low carbon lifestyle on uh, and so yes everything gets recycled 
into uh, local labor and local good causes. Oh, nice. I'd like to have some pictures of that. If you've got some, that would be terrific. Yes, uh, well, one of them is behind me. This is my view uh, to the north. Oh, wow. You know where I'm speaking to you from. Yeah, that's gorgeous. Fantastic. So the the actual, let's just say you get a phone call from a university saying, I want to look into what you're doing. Doing, We want to kind of incorporate that in into our programming, our curriculum or whatever. What What is your response to that, that person that calls? Well, um, firstly, that's great because- <laughs> Yay, <university>, happy dance. <laughs> the university that recognizes the need for change mm -hmm. um, is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, now, many universities have sustainability statements they have sustainability offices which often concentrate on their estates and their energy efficiency and so on all good stuff all, all good motherhood and apple pie investments mm -hmm. um what we're really interested in is, is the university or the college that says and we want to enrich our curriculum yes. with mm -hmm. knowledge that we don't currently offer our students mm -hmm. now anyone who's been involved in university either as an administrator, as a professor, uh, or as a student, mm -hmm. will know that, that academic decision-making, so what knowledge goes into what programs, is a painfully slow process. And of course, it depends on the interests and the knowledge mm -hmm. of the people who are there, who may have mm -hmm. been in the system for 20, 30 years and are very erudite and very smart. Um, but they may not be fully plugged into the knowledge that's required for this generation of students and subsequent generations of students. Mm -hmm. So we want universities that are willing to look at their curriculum and fast track changes to their curriculum, mm -hmm. obviously with the support of their academic staff, their deans and their administrators, mm -hmm. which are happy to acknowledge that there's a world of information and knowledge out there that is suitable for, for credit um activity that can be plugged and played into existing programs of all disciplines immediately and, and that's the opportunity that, that uh, we want universities and colleges to respond to and, and so we're building that coalition as we speak okay well i am not in academics but i think i like it when people paint me a picture so you were given an example a little bit when we were talking uh ago a little while ago um about what if it was engineering or whatever it was. So if you could if you could go a little further with that and kind of share how a university might plug and play something like this into a curriculum and where where might be the best place to start? Is this something they do across the board? Would it be just they pick one one area, one curriculum to concentrate on? Or how does that Yeah, work? I mean most universities are kind of coalitions of, of somewhat balkanized power structures. Yeah. Um, uh, and so everything depends on what this faculty or that faculty or this college or that college wants to do. It's very, very rare, and I speak as a former university president, that the president can say, top down, mm -hmm. this is what we're doing, uh, without risking mm -hmm. you know, a revolt. So, um, yeah, starting with one program and then expanding is, is, is probably uh, the simplest thing to do. And for that, of course, you need a local champion. So you need a local academic uh, with a program. So you need the, the person who's running the engineering program mm -hmm. um, and you need their dean and sometimes their disciplinary area group to say, yes, we believe this is the right thing to do and an effective thing to do. Mm -hmm. So if you take engineering, um, Often engineering curricula are constrained by the requirements of the engineering profession. I was just coming to that. <laughs> yeah, in the state or the province or the country yeah. Yeah. involved. And, and engineering professional groups are like accounting professional groups. Mm -hmm. Every other professional group, yeah. health sciences, medics, etc. And they have hundreds of years of, of dictating what should go into curricula to the extent they're now bursting at the seams these yeah. curricula and it's very difficult to take something out and put something in mm -hmm. that is for credit so that's why it takes a little bit of, of bravery courage innovative spirit you might say 
to say to your professional organization in your state or province or country, you know what, uh, we're going to put this content into our engineering degree. We're still going to make sure that all the professional requirements are mm -hmm. adhered to, but we're going to make sure that every one of our engineering students gets a class on systems thinking or um, uh, you know, engineering and society, which then unlocks the conversation about why engineers should be producing innovations that will lead to a decarbonized, socially just world in the next 20, 30 years, rather than perpetuating yeah. business as usual. So it starts with, with an academic who's running a program with the support of their colleagues locally, uh, the support of their dean, where that nothing happens in universities, uh, and the professional body to which they are responsible. That's a conversation that can occur, and it is indeed occurring in some places, uh, which will then lead to the enrichment of curricula and the opening up of, of, of much broader ideas for what an engineer should be, you know, what an engineer will contribute in, in the course of their career in the ensuing 30, 40 years, because most people want to make a difference in their lives and they, they want to impact positively mm -hmm. on you know, the people that they serve, whether they're in the public sector or the private sector. So we believe this is, you know, human nature should welcome this, but we just have to overcome the institutional and professional barriers which sometimes stand in the way of this kind of program enrichment. Right. So where where does where does the organization fit into that conversation? Um, are you the guiding force on how to to do this? How to how do you fit in that mechanism for getting that done in a say in a university setting? Let's go there first. Well, so so we we are yes currently pulling together an international coalition of universities that have mm -hmm. uh, content uh, through open educational resources. MOOCs, massive open online courses, which are prepared to offer that content in a tailored way to programs globally. So we're pulling together that coalition. We're also speaking to student organizations because of course, uh, it, it will be the demand of students, these yep. kinds of changes that will drive everything. Uh, when I was a, a, a humble professor 20, 30 years ago, I always benefited from the passion of my students for questions of sustainability. And it was very difficult for my business school at the time or the university that I was working in to say, this is a bad idea if, if the students are clamoring. So we, we do need you know, student organizations on the side. And, and that there is a lot of evidence that students around the world are getting impatient uh, for these kind of reforms. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's the, Fridays for a Future movement started with Greta Thunberg and so on, uh, which is kind of challenging, but, you know, they are indicative of, of a broader movement saying, you know, we want our degrees and our qualifications to be relevant. We don't want them to be 19th century knowledge dressed up for the 21st mm -hmm. century. Mm -hmm. so, so students are a big part of it. So we're reaching out to international student organizations. Um, and of course, we're very interested in linking to networks of universities and colleges that share our values. So, you know, there are networks of, of colleges and universities in, in the US and there are individual colleges and universities in the US which seem to be going in this direction. And uh, so we welcome direct participation by individual institutions and by mm -hmm. networks of colleges and universities who see the logic of what we're arguing. So that's again, part of the coalition building. And of course we are raising money. So that's always important. <laughs> Everybody needs that. But um, the, the great thing with this is that it pays for itself. And so uh, within five to six years, uh, as we build out the open educational resource bank, if you like, mm -hmm. all these books that will be basically acceptable in all the programs everywhere, as we build those out, um, that then begins to attract uh, um, a modest revenue stream that pays for the whole thing to perpetuate and grow at costs that are equivalent to costs 
that people would pay in a global south in a country like Costa Rica mm -hmm. um, for a regular university uh, program. So we we think this can all be done on a non-profit, low-cost basis. Uh, I mean, we have admiration for, for people like University of the People, um, which aims to provide uh, mm -hmm. university education for free, and that that is feasible in this model, as long as the local university, the participating university, provides all the credit to their students. Yeah. Um, but if you need external credit to plug and play into mm -hmm. these programs, that's also doable. That creates a non-profit revenue stream that drives growth. Yeah. University of the people is, is something we deeply admire because of their values. But what is hard to imagine is that scaling to 10 million or 100 million mm -hmm. students because it, it's largely dependent on a, a voluntary contribution right. from enlightened professors. What we're trying to do is to build a, a, a machine build a mechanism that will grow because you have the right investments turning into the right levels of support and it becomes one massive global social enterprise in that sense i kind of think i'll think about this uh in terms of like in the healthcare setting it's a standard of care so it becomes a standard of education uh sure. at some point within a, a whole country but yeah. uh and yeah. i want to get back to the the students that you mentioned because it, two things that occurred to me here is you've got the students that uh, are learning. And so they're gonna take that as part of their education on their resume, their CV, whatever you wanna call it, and, and then go look for a job when they graduate. So does that four credit class then translate to something that's meaningful for them to actually pull out of their education and put on their resume, if that makes sense, to get them into a company that really cares about that because they care about that. So, it, you know, I would think that would be attractive to uh, an employer to see that, knowing that they also have those values, that they are, that that's somebody they want to hire. Is that something? Yes, that would exactly. Be and, and so, you know, I think the way the world is going as we mm -hmm. transition from, you know, industrialization 2.0, or 3.0, wherever you want to place it, mm -hmm. to a new form of industrialization, which is a greener economy as we do that transition uh and it will take decades obviously mm -hmm. it's not happening fast enough it needs to happen faster but we have to recognize it will take decades uh, there will be more and more employers who say well this is absolutely the kind of people we need to employ um but but the skills don't necessarily just relate to knowledge of what the issues are yeah they mostly relate to broader systems thinking, mm -hmm. problem solving skills. Which is extremely transferable too. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, uh, and you know, I, I, I'm you know, a big fan of, of the thinking that says that you know, what makes you most employable mm -hmm. in coming years and decades is the ability to be creative. Now, that applies whether or not you care about sustainability or the climate crisis yeah. or not. You know, it's just good to have do. anyway. Yeah. But, you know, you aren't going to need to understand as a graduate of any discipline mm -hmm. that your main offer as a graduate is your ability to see the big picture, understand problem solving, understand innovation, uh, and then turn that into actionable projects and products mm -hmm in public sector or private sector that will benefit people in the world as it's unfolding rather than the world as it has been. So we like to think of this not as a niche play because you know I've spent a lot of years teaching mm -hmm. students who believe in sustainability and I yeah. love them all and still in touch with many of them. Um, but it won't be the people who only understand sustainability that will carry this transition. It'll be the people who understand the broader issues, who understand that the world is changing rapidly and can surf those changes and make a difference to society, mm -hmm. to customers, clients, uh, as they do that. And, and I think those are broader skills. So we, we like to think of this as a mainstream argument, although of course it is ushering in a new world and hopefully employers and hopefully universities themselves understand that this is the best way to equip your graduates yeah. for fruitful employment but also happy lives because part of this is is soft skills development you know it's, it's about understanding 
how organizations work, mm. how we manage ourselves and our expectations. Yeah. Uh, and I think it, it's not just about being a great engineer, if you're an engineer, or a great medic, if you're a medic. Yeah. It's also about understanding social dynamics and how we can be more effective people yeah. in our workplaces, mm -hmm. uh, whether that's a startup or a lumbering large corporation or a lumbering public institution. Um, how can we be more effective as people in our work lives and indeed in our personal lives? Because this is a scary world we are now moving towards. <laughs> and there needs to be some internal resilience built for yeah. young people as well as external saleable skills to future employers. I think you just hit on about five of the top 10 um, most desirable traits in employees that Forbes put out like a year and a half ago. Uh, and one of those, that, that the first one that you, you hit was the problem solving piece, that being a good problem solver um, and strategic thinking or creative thinking, that sort of thing, critical yeah. thinking skills, all of that. Yeah. Um, so we move on from maybe the student then into the employer, because you mentioned that sometimes the student's the one that drives the, um, the education <laughs> piece of things. But um, in a conversation several years ago with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which has a workforce readiness sort of department, yeah. by the way, um, mentioned that they were working with employers to find out what they felt like the future of work, you know, the, the needs would be as they, they move along. And it makes me think about, um, you know, what th th they're, they're also a stakeholder in determining what the, what the education, so they need to be communicating, you know, the, the universities and the employers, but, and that was one thing that the, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce was, was working on was pushing that together um, to, so that they could talk together and so they could understand from each other what, what the other needs. Um, and they're not the only entity that was working on that. The same time I was talking to them, I was talking to other university systems that were interested in that same thing. Um, and that it's probably been about five years ago, but um, I'm not sure they nailed that down yet, by the way, <laughs> I'm just saying, uh, I'm not sure I see the evidence of that happening yet, but I think the work is really important and I think they are working very hard on it. But I'm thinking from the standpoint of the employer is making sure that they, that they're communicating what it is that they need along with the students saying, this is what we, we need. So as the employers wake up, maybe they're waking up faster than university systems, I don't know, to you know the sustainability piece, then um, them understanding that is key. But you know, as I even back it up from there, um, I always think of um, I come from a chamber of commerce background. I ran a chamber for a number of years, and I, you always think about incentives. <laughs> How do we incentivize this population or this segment of our business community to do what we need them to do? With this other segment. Um, is that is that something you see working anywhere in any countries that you're operating in as to where governments are creating incentives for universities to to plug this into their uh, their programs? Yes, and and, and um, often you know it, it's the college system, you know the, the two year degree system folk who are most closely aligned with local business interests rather than the you know, the, the sort of top universities that, that you know, go on regardless because that's who they are. Um, so, for example, one project we helped start up in Canada uh, a couple of years back uh, was called Canadian Colleges for a Resilient Recovery. So this is when everyone was thinking about how do we build back better, to borrow yep. to Biden's phrase uh, <laughs> after the pandemic, and and uh, you know the build back better concept is was and is an international one, uh, so it it has meaning, you know not just in the US but but in mm -hmm. Canada, in Europe, and many other places, mm -hmm. um, and and so we started talking to a group of colleges, uh, one of which we we were working very closely with anyway. Uh, called, called Mohawk College in Ontario. And uh, we recruited then another 10 or 12 uh, community colleges from across Canada to build the case to the Canadian federal government that what was required was a specific investment in the greener skills of tomorrow because you couldn't, you couldn't introduce a green recovery without you had the skills um, amongst 
mm-hmm. that cohort of students who are going to deliver whether it's renewable energy, energy efficiency, green agriculture, whatever. Anyway, that, that has proven to be very successful, that, that project, uh, more to be announced very soon. And uh, it's, it's an example of where, you know, the federal government in that case gets the skills agenda, um, local businesses, chambers of commerce and so on, get the skills agenda, uh, and then the colleges seek to meet that agenda. Now, that works at the community college level, I, I'd say, best in most jurisdictions. It's certainly, that's where most of the interesting conversations are in the UK, which is where I'm from originally, as you may have picked up, um, but also many other countries, Germany and yeah. so on. What is slower always is the conversation between academic institutions, well-appointed universities and the business community. And, and partly that's because, you know, although the business community puts a lot of money into um, academic institutions, they can't buy the curriculum because the curriculum is very jealously guarded. I was just going to say, there's a, there's a frame around that. <laughs> so, so with a college, a community college, they say, sure, tell us what skills you need and we'll go away and make them happen. Right. A university doesn't react like that typically, and, and its faculty would resist that very strongly if they have the faculty association or the faculty union in their corner, because you know no one tells us what to do. We're academics, and we, we you know have this way of doing knowledge, knowledge development. So, Military, so you can us. <laughs> in, in my experience, universities are much, much less responsive, and it is frustrating. Mm-hmm. commerce industry i know because i've been involved in those conversations and i would venture to guess that many of the conversations in the u.s between chambers of commerce and universities are sometimes a dialogue of the deaf right because mm-hmm. you know you, you don't have the proper understanding on both sides about what can be achieved mm-hmm. so some somehow we have to transcend that and i think students are the key because mm-hmm. if the students are saying to both employers and academic institutions, these are the skills that we believe we will need to navigate our future careers. Then there's a there's a there's a kind of an integrating ground. It's no longer just mm-hmm. the employers saying this is what we need, although they should continue saying that. As mm-hmm. you mentioned, critical thinking, you know, uh, systems thinking, you know, yeah. creativity, strategic thinking, you know, being able to read and write. Effectively, you know, these are the things that chambers of commerce are always asking. For. So keep that dialogue going. Yeah, and enrich it with the voice of the students, and then it becomes much more compelling. And I think it can be a more uh, congenial conversation because it's not like um, we're trying to push academia and academia yeah. just go there. This is a more collective conversation that involves the students and their futures, and we should all be working on that. Well, I'm going to put a note out here to Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. <laughs> so, pay attention. <laughs> to well, I have to say, but, but Bill and Melinda Gates have been very active in this space mm-hmm. um, in yep. education. Yeah. Um, for sure, I think they would get what we're trying to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're, they're a very enlightened organization. And, and yeah. uh, we all watch them. Bill writes yeah. about this stuff all the time, and yeah. I know it's near and dear to his heart. Um, something else that just came to my mind, and I saw it on um, a news show this past week, is an organization. Actually, it's a foundation, the Schmidt Foundation, I believe is what it's called. And they give out innovation awards to brilliant young high school students all across the world. Yeah. And, you know, innovation from the standpoint of solving big problems. And it's amazing what these young people have come up with. Um, so they're borderline crossing over into college life, these young yeah. people. They need to be your ambassadors. <laughs> but, yes, uh, the, yeah, the program's called RISE, R-I-S-E. Right, yeah. I've heard of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you, know, the, the, you know, the bottom line here is that uh, it, it's student tuition mm-hmm. and to a certain extent government or state support yeah. that drives these machines. And if the students start saying, you know, we're going to go to you know, Yale versus Harvard, or we're going to go to yeah. you know, Arizona State. Right over here versus... where they have that, you know, that curriculum yeah. that we want. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that starts a dynamic. Yeah. Uh, and I do think that, that students you know, um, 
being clear and, and they should form these views when they're in, in high schools too, yes. Being yes. about what, what is best going to set them up for success that, that's really where the conversation needs to start but for sure there are, there are many foundations who understand this who understand and are frustrated by the slow yes. pace of pace yes. change in, in academia and I think Bill Gates was predicting the demise of academia five or six years ago because it is so slow and because it is so uh, ponderous in terms of it, its response to the opportunities. But that, that's really where we're trying to use new technology. We're trying to use MOOCs mm -hmm. to fast track some of these changes because yeah. those products already exist. They can already be used and they can already enrich curricula. All you need is the local demand to be in place. It. So it's kind of a, a pushing in a, as an open door argument. Yeah. Um, as long as we can get students yeah. aligned, employers aligned, and enlightened universities to take a lead, because it, it will be the universities that want to position themselves in this way that will usher in the changes yeah. faster. So, from an organizational standpoint, um, this is ongoing. This is something you do. You work at every day, all all the time, but. Is there any particular um, event or anything that's coming along in the, between now and the end of the year, or at least at the first part of next year, that's coming along that may help push the envelope for you a little bit that you're doing, that you're working uh, on? Here? Well, we, we're always writing stuff. Um, so we have we have a, a, a journal, um, which uh, I'm co-editing okay. with uh, US and, and UK colleagues about change in academia. So that will include a number of case studies. Um, is that like a newsletter that people sign up for or is that something you're producing once you get it all put together? It, it'll be an open access journal. So an academic journal edition. Yeah, okay. We'll have yeah. 10 or 12 of these kinds of um, case studies in them. Okay. Uh, plus some analysis as to why things don't happen as fast as they should. Um, so that, that will be out, I think, in the spring of next year. Okay. Uh, it's almost like a white paper, uh, kind of. <laughs> Just a... Yes. And, and from that, there should be, you know, more popular articles deriving from the journal. Um, and I think, you know, we, we assuming we get moving on the the bigger project that I've outlined, then obviously we'll be launching the website and everything else publicly. At the moment we're behind the scenes coalition building, but yeah. we would hope within two to three months to go live with the website and, and then yeah. that will be available. And that will include some relevant think pieces, some calls to action and some ways to organize um, whether you're an employer of the future whether you're a university of the future yeah. or whether you're a student who cares about their uh, careers being relevant and impactful and yeah. navigable. Um, so there'll be a way to be organized through that website um, as well. Fantastic. Um, last question, and I think you've answered it pretty much all the way along, but I'm gonna give you that shot at, at thinking through maybe somebody else that you hadn't thought of. Who do you need to help you move your impact forward other than universities that we know you need and groups of universities and groups of students? Um, who else? Yeah, so we are talking to foundations um, who, who share our values and, and our vision. So um, please offer small prayers in support of those conversations. <laughs> um, but we, we do think we are pushing at an open door, really. Okay. Um, so uh, we'd be pretty optimistic that um, the funding will materialize. And, and the way we've structured all of this, it, it doesn't require big upfront investments. That's the beauty of the new technologies around MOOCs. Um, they scale automatically. It's just a question of how do you harness that scaling mm. and direct it for a social purpose, which is, yeah. Uh, the one we've described. So, yeah, so, um, you know, we, we are in active discussion with foundations and um, we're hopeful that we'll be able to accelerate things pretty fast. Well, fantastic. You've got 
big work ahead of you and you've been doing it all along. So uh, this is no big surprise, but uh, we hope people are listening that are affiliated with academic settings uh, and even, you know, uh, in any area where this is a concern, where this is an issue, whether you have your hands on large groups, because I have a lot of people who follow me that were are involved in youth development worldwide. I serve on a couple of the international boards myself in that regard. And uh, this is a hot topic. This is an issue everybody is concerned with. Um, it, this is an opportunity though with what David's sharing is to put action to the words, <laughs> put action to the heart that you, you have for it uh, and to be able to kind of do something proactive. So uh, thank you very much, uh, David. Appreciate your time today and sharing all this, this good information that we did not know before you showed up here. <laughs> And uh, knowing that there's something this easy, if it were easy, <laughs> to be able to use. I mean, it's easy to use. It's just, e it's the decision-making process to get there that is the, the stumbling block. So we want to remove that if we can. So thank you again. We appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to say, stay with me for just a second and say goodbye to everybody else. If you're watching this on uh, YouTube, go to www frontrunnersinnovate.com. And we'll have some extra information David has shared with us uh, to go along with it and some pictures. He promised me some pictures. So we like this to, to get a look at uh, some farming um, that he's got going on there in Costa Rica. And I keep saying I'm going to get there. I've not done the Costa Rica trip, but that's coming. That is coming. So thank you, everybody. Good. And uh, yeah, say goodbye. <laughs> Happy front running. Take care. Yeah.